Hey everybody, it's Robert Gowan sitting here at uh, Pearl and Pine Brewery. Appreciate these guys allowing us uh, once again to come here and enjoy the uh, the brewery and tape here this podcast episode. And I'm joined by my co-host. Hey, it's Kyle. And we're sitting here with Mike, and Mike appreciates you so much uh, for coming here. You didn't have to drive too damn far because you no, live right down not. the road. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> appreciate you coming on the podcast, though. I appreciate you guys having me, and uh, I'm glad I reached out, too. So I can't remember what episode you did, but you said, you know, something about being in Atlanta, or maybe the guest did, and, you know, I just reached out like, hey, you guys out here? And it's just amazing. I keep on finding people that are just located in the area. Yeah, yeah it was uh, with Chris Van Sant, and yeah, I was talking right, about, yeah. yeah. So let's get into um, a little bit about your background. So, um, you know, when where is, what is home, first off? Is it Georgia? No, Georgia. No, it's, uh, that's a... <laughs> That's a funny story, and I, my wife and I, we laugh all the time about being in Georgia. So I'm originally from Montana, and my wife's originally from Maine. In fact, the first time I came to Georgia you know, in 1998 for you know, basic training, I was like, oh, cool, this is where I come to die. Because the heat, the humidity, <laughs> I'm like, yep, yep, I'm going to die. You're like, there's no doubt about it, you know, because uh, the heat in Montana is very, very different. And, uh, yeah, so I'm originally from Montana. And where, where about in Montana? Yeah, so I'd love to say, you know, Yellowstone, cool, you know, beautiful areas. Yeah, now. The Dakota side yeah, of Montana. the Dakota <laughs> side. So what I commonly tell people is, yeah. it's like, hey, you know, the mountains, and they get, like, all excited and everything. I'm like, yeah, keep on fucking driving. Not, not, <laughs> not <there. laughs> Well, I say that uh, also because I will be going out to Kalispell, so oh, I'm sure yeah. you know of that yeah, area absolutely. and stuff, and we plan on doing some hiking out in the mountains, yeah. and we're going to do that the first week of October, and i got to tell you, I haven't talked to somebody who lives in or yeah. is from Montana um, to understand what the hell I'm supposed to pack, because yeah. when I look at the weather, it looks like it could be one of these things I need to pack coats and yeah. everything else from shorts. I, I don't yeah. know what the hell. Yeah, so uh, funny, I actually just got back from in July. I took my boys out to Glacier National and we spent a week hiking up there. Absolutely beautiful, gorgeous. Um, can't recommend it enough. I will say that they've made it very difficult to enjoy it though. Um, you have to have like reservations for everything. Um, even to get on, you get like a gate pass, you get like a drive through pass and everything else. That's, they still won't let you in. You have to have a reservation at a campground. So just something to keep in mind. If anybody's go out there, they've made it very difficult to get in. So I didn't totally realize that, know that like cowboy camping, like you gotta be very careful with that. Like not saying that I did that. Well, actually I'm not in the military. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was cowboy camping the shit out of that, you know? So, um, because otherwise you're just going to be around people and that's not the idea, you know? Um, but back to your question. Yep. You have no idea. Okay. It could be 99 degrees. Okay. In October up there with, you know, hair dryer wind. Okay. And then the next morning you wake up and, uh, it could be snowing. So prepare wow. for everything. Um, Rain, gloom, yeah. You need to be prepared for a lot of different things. Sounds like you need to layer up. Yep. Yeah. A lot, yeah. A lot of loose fitting layers there, Rob. Yeah. So. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah. So because you can get those Indian summers. Yeah. But, you know, and then where you're at, you know, you got, you know, everything coming from the coast across the mountains and mm -hmm. it developing over the mountains and then dumping, you know, on both sides, both ways, you know, and then, uh, you know, you got the Chinook winds that come up from Wyoming, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, you, you never know what you're going to get in the October time frame. Well, I, we went out to Wyoming last year or two years ago yeah. in Jackson area and oh, stuff. Yeah, so yeah. we went there right in the transition. I think it was between May and June. So it was a period where yeah. the, I think they would just come out of the, the winter and the skiing and the summer crowd hasn't quite arrived. And we got great rates on hotels and and such like that. Um, so we thought, oh, let's do this again. Because like you said, you go out there and we travel, say, a half a mile down the road. We didn't get reception on our phones. So yeah. It was good in a good way, you know, because then you nobody could call you and bother you and gave you a chance to check out. You could use it as a camera. Um, the bad part was if you ran into any uh, difficulties, no, you don't have a phone to be yeah. able to call out of that. So that was uh, that was a little bit of a pain in the butt for that aspect of it. Well, we had bear spray and, and yeah. the whole bed and we were catching them coming out of hibernation. I guess now we're going to be going with them going into hibernation. Yeah. At least I hope so. Yeah. Well, and this is uh, a that is a very critical time because they're trying to do the last fattening up, you know, right before, you know, they go into their winter slumber. So definitely something to think through. For uh, sure, so. Yeah, I never really thought too much about that. I thought they'd be well, probably. Well, you just got to, you taking your kids? No, oh, no. Okay. No, you no, just, no, just adults. Yeah, you just got to outrun the slow <laughs> <laughs> 
it's funny because uh, we would be in the uh, we'd be on the trail there in uh, Wyoming. And uh, my friend was carrying the bear spray and he always had his hand like this, just ready and like scoping left and right. And sometimes I would joke with him and I'd put my back and I'd turn around and cover the, so we had 360 and everything coverage and stuff as we were walking down the trail. And then some guy would go walking along with his walking stick with his young kid. And we'd both hit each other like, yeah, we're good then. Now yeah. we're good now, <laughs> we're good to go. <laughs> so like, like right before I went, you know, my wife's like, well, what are you gonna do about bears? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm gonna take, you know, my 45, you know, yeah. This is what I'm going to do. And she's like, and she, she sends me like a bunch of research about how 45s are ineffective against bears. Nah. Like, you know, and I'm like, okay, okay. You know, and I took the approach of, you know, babe, like, don't worry about it. Like, it's going to be okay. And then, and then I start, and then I just changed. And I said, babe, are you telling me you want me to get a new gun? If you're telling me you That's want me to get a new gun, I'll just get what? a new gun. I do need a 454 <laughs> Casole, yeah. so yeah, we'll go get one of those. So too. that's what we ended up doing. Nice. I ended up getting a new gun, you know. Well, no lie, you yeah. actually did then. What did you end up getting? I ended up doing a 10 mil. Nice. Um, so, and it's, you know, a Glock, uh, what's that? Shoot, totally forgot. I can't remember which Glock it is. 19? No, no. I don't think it's a 19. Is it a 20? At uh, maybe you're it's right. A 20. I yeah. think it's a Glock 20. Yeah, it's a Glock 20. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so those are supposed to take the uh, the bears down then? Yeah, well, you figure how many rounds you got, mm -hmm. you know. I'm pretty confident in my ability. And at the end of the day, I just had to run, outrun my slowest son. You know? <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got three of them. You know, it's not that big of a deal. You know? <laughs> uh, they, did not, they do not like awesome. that joke, by the way. <laughs> they did not think that was funny. <laughs> so do you guys do like the bear bells and everything like that on the pack? And uh, like, you hey, know, bear, when you're no, in the thick spot? I only did it in one spot. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it was because we were kind of traversing, you know, some ravines, and yeah. it was really thick, really thick. Yeah. You know, so I was just doing the hay bear, yeah. you know, hay bear, hay bear, you know. But everywhere else, like I was like, unless like you know, there's a ninja bear, yeah. like you know, just you know, sitting there waiting and lie, you know, for somebody to walk by. But there's so many people, like in Glacier, yeah. that you know, there's plenty of other people that were probably easier targets that bear would have got. Yeah, well, you go on some of those hikes when I was stationed in Alaska, and they'll be like, oh, trailhead yeah. shut down. Well, there's Alaska's a fresh a kill over beast, there, yeah. but. But where you're going to Montana, I want to say is, isn't it like the most populous area for grizzly bears uh, in yeah. the contiguous United States? Yeah, it probably is. Just a heads up. Yeah, know? just a heads up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Like statistically, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, you know, as far as where there's more bear attacks. I mean, definitely Alaska. That's a different beast. Yeah, yeah for sure. So. So, so you end up starting off in Montana and growing up there. So I take it you went all the way through high school and everything. And so what made you go into the military? Yeah, I mean, my military, you know, decision was a very, very easy one. And, uh, you know, I don't claim to be the smartest kid, you know, or smartest guy. But I remember, like, being at this kegger, okay? You know, I'm about 16, 17 years old. You know, we're drinking, doing what high school kids do. And I just remember I'm watching all these like 20, 21 year old guys and they're hitting on all the girls, like our girls, girls that are our classmates. And I just had like this moment, like, this is me. This is who I will become. I will be 20, 21 years old, going to high school parties, selling pot, you know, just existing in life. I, I don't want that to be me. You know, because I definitely grew up in a lot of mediocrity. I mean, I love my parents. They're amazing people. They have amazing work ethic. Um, but, you know, they didn't strive. They didn't push themselves. They didn't take risks, you know. And uh, I knew I didn't want to do that. I knew I wanted to do something different. I want to be the difference maker in my family, you know. And I just recognize that from a young age because, you know, of kind of, you know, just how I grew up, you know. And we can, we can dive into that. I grew up, you know, a bastard to a, you know, 15 year old single mother, you know? Um, so I just knew I had to do something different. Well, there's not a lot of options in Montana, especially where I grew up in Montana. You either work on the oil fields, you'll find some lame ass job in the small town cause it's a very small town. Um, and that's about it. Or you sell pot, you know, um, meth wasn't really kind of a thing back then, you know? And that was about it. And I was like, okay, well, I got to do something different. And there was a little bit of a military presence. Um, you know, my uncle was in the military. Um, he definitely uh, offered himself up as having a very different military career than he actually did. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, I was like, well, the military's a route. How soon can I join? How soon can I get the hell out of here? So I graduated um, and left three days later, you know, and shipped off. And, uh, you know, knew that I wanted to do something a little bit different in the military, just didn't want to kind of be the regular guy. Found out about Ranger Regiment, you know, Black Beret, 
you know, saw the videos that we all saw, you know, and it's like, okay, that's, that's what I want to do, you know, and we just went down that pathway. Um, so and, option 40 then I did not actually have an option 40. I will say my recruiter, um, besides being, um, extremely drunk all the time, he was actually a really good researcher. Um, and he actually did call some people and he's like, listen, I can't get you an option 40 contract. Um, but I can get you to airborne school and then you can volunteer there. Um, so that's what I did, you know, so I went to airborne school and, you know, just asked around, found the ranger recruiter, um, because like it was, you know, they usually don't come till like usually the second week of airborne school yeah. is when they start coming doing their pitches. But I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose my opportunity. So I found his office, like left him notes, like knocked on the door. You know, I was like trying to find this guy. Um, so when he finally did show up to do like the brief, you know, and they come out and they're like, Hey, anybody that wants to, or has ever thought about going to Ranger regiment, you know, go over to the right. And this guy's going to talk to you. So I went over there, you know, I like ran over there. He's like, you're the dude that's been beating on my door and leaving me like all these notes. I'm like, yep, absolutely. That's me. Um, you know, so he's like, you're good, man. Like just finish airborne school. I got you. I got your name. Cause I was supposed to go to the 82nd airport. That's what I had orders for. You know, duffel bag drag, they show up, you know, we graduate airborne school. Funny, uh, just, you know, one funny little quip about that is, is this guy that I went through like everything with like basic airborne was ranger, ranger, ranger. He was a guy like wake up at three o'clock in the morning to spit shine his boots, you know, basic training, airborne school, all this stuff. And, uh, he went there and, uh, you know, I did run into him like later on. I'm like, Hey, what happened? He's like, man, I just. I just, you know, I got in my head. I knew it was going to be hard. We just went through all this stuff. Like, and, you know, I just, I didn't think I could do it. And I was like, yeah, well, you, you probably could have, um, you know, so it sucks to suck. And uh, it's always been like a, a thing that I've thought about throughout my life that you make things out in your head so bad. Mm. And how many people, you know, military, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, don't do something because of that risk of failure, you know, and that fear. That is one thing that we we just recently taped at Ranger Regiment. And yeah, that's one thing episode, that they the hit Thank you. was yeah. don't self-select, don't yes. self-select, don't yeah. self-select. And it yeah. was that was one of the biggest reasons why they couldn't get people there. Yeah. Well, they talk about how so many go option 40. And actually, um, I know that people are going to be listening to this episode. And they I want to go ahead and throw this out there again because I see all these comments that are going on. And youtube page and everything else you don't have to have an option 40. No. as a matter of fact the people who get option 40s are the ones who are usually the first to do like your friend and check themselves out they go yep. thinking that's what they want to do they want to be an airborne ranger and all of that and then they go off to osit and when they get into one station unit training they decide hey this isn't for me yeah. but they're in an option 40 and now they're trying to get out of it the guys who really make it are the ones who are studs physically and you know their minds in the right place and they're interested when they go to OSIT or when they go to airborne yeah. school and they go, Hey, I want to volunteer. Those are the guys that make it. Yeah. But you know, it's just these like things that we learn and things that we hear. Okay. So <clears throat> just for example, like when I was in high school, I don't, I can't even tell you where I got it in my head, but I was convinced that in order to get into range regiment, I had to be able to do 100 push-ups in two minutes, 100 sit-ups in two minutes, and run an 11-minute two-mile. Holy cow. And that is like, I was trying to do that. Okay, and I'm not an athletic guy, okay, yeah. despite my amazing physique. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. Um, I'm actually not, like, normally just like a physical. I'm not a genetic freak, okay? Yeah. Like, I've always had to bust my ass, but uh, just to keep up with the slowest guy, right? But uh, I just had it in my head that I had to do this. And then, like, I show up to basic training, and they're like, you got to do 11 push-ups. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, in airborne school, you don't have to do any push-ups. You got to do pull-ups. And then, like... You know, when you get to rip, they're, you know, like, hey, this is the cutoff. This is what you got to do. 70 percent, you know, yada, yada. And I was like, where in the hell did I get that in my head that I had to do that? And I still can't tell you where I got it in my head. And quite frankly, I've never I've only ever done 100 sit ups. That's that's it. I've never done any of that other stuff. Well, the there it's funny that you mentioned that as well, because there's so many people want to know how they can prepare for it. And yeah. then they may do all of these physical things like you're describing, and they're actually going to bring you and tear you down then a basic yeah. training and OSIT because you're not going to be required to do yeah. as much. And so you went there and got physically fit. And then of course, you can't maintain that yeah. in the lifestyle, they're now going to put you into OSIT. Yeah. And that's the whole idea, though, is that nobody 
So pre-RASP and everything now is all set up, and yeah. RASP is set up to to get you to that phase. They're not expecting you to walk in there and be a physical specimen. No, you know? they're not. Yeah. Yeah. They're absolutely not. But, it, you know, that those things that we just get in our heads and those yeah. things that people like tell us, you know, throughout our careers. And then we just, we overplay them in our mind, you know, and I'm battling that with actually my oldest son right now. You know, he's got this, you know, just thought this expectation because he's got me, you know, the dad that was a ranger, you know, for many years, you know, um, you know, I'm actually a stepfather, um, but his, and his dad was a PJ, you know, and he, so he like just has this like false expectation. I'm listen, I'm like, listen, man, just pull the trigger go do it. You're ready. You're fine. You're in really good shape actually, you know, and you'll, and, and you'll figure it out. Like, don't worry about it. You know, yeah. but, uh, if you just keep on with this decision, constipation and this expectation, this false expectation, you're just, you're never going to get there anyway. You know, I went through a 25 year career and like I said, I still never did a hundred pushups, a hundred <laughs> sit-ups in 11 minute, two mile, you know? So, so you started off in uh, RIP and we got obviously now called RAS, uh, yeah. Ranger Assessment Selection. So you uh, end up getting into regiment. So after RIP, what, how did you get the assignment? Um, people always have a story about that too. You know, like, is I, it really, in, yeah. I really don't actually. I, I, I just didn't want to stay at 375 because I didn't really like four bending. I mean, but what the hell did I really know about four bending? Like, let's just be honest here. I knew victory you know, drive, like that was about it. And, you know, four bending proper, like that's all I really knew, you know? So, um, I, but I really didn't care. Um, I put my name in the hat for two seven five and that's where I went, you know? Um, and it was, it was, there was really, I, I I'm sorry. I don't have a story about that. Like it was, if I would have went somewhere else, I guess it would have went a different path. Um, maybe, but, uh, because I will say this, when I went to two seven five, I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm pretty close to Montana. Um, I do like the outdoors. I like the wood, you know, I like all this stuff. Um, but, um, I am the guy that had a terrible experience. I did not like Ranger Regiment. It was fucking horrid. Um, I was not treated like a human being. I was treated like an animal. Um, I was humiliated, hazed. I mean, like there's hazing. And then there's just t treating you like a subservient human. And that's what I was treated like. Uh, my leaders were fucking awful. Absolute dog shit. Um, they were drunk all the time. Um, they cared more about uh, Thirsty Thursdays. I don't think it was called that, that back then. That's probably a newer thing. But like <laughs> Women's Night Wednesdays, you know, like. And there was no training. Like I wasn't taught anything. Um, PT was weird. You know, it was. Like this one guy, the other team leader, he was a really good team leader. Um, actually, you might have heard of him, Brandon Jackson. He actually died a couple of years ago um, in a halo accident. Um, you know, he's uh, Delta Force. You know, he went on to Delta Force and everything else. Most of the time, it was just him running as fast as he could and us just trying to keep up. Why the squad leader went and, you know, nursed a hangover. And then the other team leaders in Tab Spec Force went and did whatever they did, you know. Um, and I just didn't like it. You know, um, and I was the guy that had the calendar on the board saying, hey, this many days until I get out of the army. And, uh, you know, had the ups and the, you know, the ups and the downs, better days and other days. Um, met some really good guys, you know, that are still lifelong friends. But by and large, it was not what I thought it was going to be. Um, wow. I mean, I, you know, as so many guys and maybe they have similar stories and they're just not um, sharing them. Yeah. But um, so many guys have a totally different experience. Yeah, but I can, I can remember the guys having been at Benning. I can remember some of the guys and especially you're talking about, you know, pre Gulf War, um, the 90s, late 90s and that type of period where it was a black beret. And it yeah. was all about being the physical specimen and yeah. running to death all the damn time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did PT from probably, you know, five, thirty six o'clock in the morning until two o'clock three yeah. o'clock in the afternoon that's all they did yeah you know at least that's all i saw of them most of the time when i went over there to the compound yeah. and so um a lot of the guys that's what happened when they were at 375 uh, 375 in that time frame was six months to two years they were out of there they were yeah. going big army somewhere yeah it, you know i mean and i you know i get the honor of sitting down with a lot of rangers and you know capturing their stories and talking about their time and I'll tell you every single time, like it, I don't want to say it makes me mad, but it like, it hits me in the gut because they talk about their first team leaders and their first squad leaders and their first platoon sergeants with just like godlike reverence, just they're how they're just the greatest human beings they've ever met in their life. And they've shaped everything they've become their whole life. And I'm just like, God dang it. Like that is awesome. 
mine were just bad humans. Like, I'm not even, like, screw them being non-commissioned officers. Screw them being Army Rangers. They were just terrible human beings, you know? And, uh, you know, it's just the luck of the draw. And, you know, so I did, I did, I will say this, though. My platoon are, um, he, he, he did hook me up. Um, we were literally getting our asses handed to us in the hallway, doing the iron chair. They were doing a squad leader meeting and he was just, you know, screaming at the squad leaders, getting pissed off the squad leaders. Cause he kept on sending guys to the ranger school PT test and they were failing. And he said, that's it. I'm done. You are done recommending who goes to take the ranger school PT test. I'm picking the next guy. And he literally walked out and just by chance, I was the only one. And it's not like, again, I'm not a physical specimen. Okay. And uh, I just happened to be the only one that was not like collapsing in the iron chair. Like for that one second, I was like perfectly 90 degrees, like just, you know, rocking it. You know, just one of those luck, luck of the draw things. He goes, Burke, you're taking the PT test tomorrow or a Monday, right? Because it was a Friday. And uh, I'd only been in Ranger Regiment like six months. So that was very unusual back then. You know, most of those guys, you know, year, you know, year and a half before they got their ranger school slot. And everybody was like, what the hell, Burke? You're going to send Burke? Like, absolutely not. And I will tell you, they proceeded to make sure that I could not pass the ranger school PT test on Monday. Um, it's, it stands up as one of the worst weekends of my life. Um, literally physical abuse. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it was, I literally dislocated my shoulder. I fell off the, I fell off a rope, um, you know, climbing the ropes cause they made me climb it to muscle failure, then climb it some more. And I literally was like, you know, 12 feet up and I fell, dislocated my shoulder, popped it back in. So that Monday morning, you know, or that Sunday, luckily, you know, one of the spec fours goes, okay, I think he's had enough. Like we're done with him. And I did what any, you know, 18 year old kid is going to do after having one of the worst weekends of his life. I proceeded to get blasted drunk, you know, makes sense, right? You know, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got hammered and uh, passed out. Uh, my, my, uh, my roommate who Josh Kelly, who's an awesome human being, love that guy to death. He woke me up, you know, hydrated me, you know, I was like, Hey man, like you got the PT test. Like you can't fuck this up. And I'm like, I don't care, man. Like, I just don't give a shit. I, I really, I can barely walk. I don't care what happens here. Like, fine, I fail it. Maybe I'll get lucky and they'll actually kick me out of the organization. At this point, I just don't care anymore, right? I, I, I don't deserve to be treated like this. I've been treated like this my whole life, like a piece of shit. And I come here to try to not be treated like that. And this is what's happening to me. Like, I don't care, right? And uh, so I remember like standing in the line, getting ready to do the push-ups, and the kid in front of me, um, you know, we're just, we're, we're kind of talking a little bit as much as Ranger privates are, are willing to talk, you know, in, in the line before the PT test. And he's like, he's like, I'm so scared. He's like, if I don't pass, my, my team leader's gonna, you know, kick my ass. And I'm like, hey, I'm like, you'll be all right, man. Like, you look like you're, you're, you're really in shape. And I'm just sitting there like, how am I gonna do push-ups without dislocating my shoulder again? And then I just remember like I had a moment. Like, you know, there's these moments through our life where I was just like, okay, all right, you know what? I'm not, no, this is not how this is gonna go. I'm gonna prove everybody wrong. I've been doing it my whole life. I've been proving everybody wrong. Everybody expected me to be in jail, you know, and just be some, you know, vagabond. Like, okay, they don't want me to do this, so I'm gonna do it. And, you know, I don't really remember the rest of the morning. But I remember them telling me, stop, because, you know, you've done, you know, like the two minutes have elapsed, stop. And then the run, only one dude and Rob Chacho, or not Chacho, yeah, Chacho, uh, just this genetic beast that I actually went through RAS with. He took the PT test with me. You know, he's just a stud. He was the only guy that finished in front of me. I don't remember the time, but I passed. And I do remember this, okay? The, one of the team leaders was standing at the finish line with the other, t the other team leader and the squad leader and some of the other team leaders in the other squad. And I remember the look on their face when I crossed the two minute, you know, you know, you know the two minute run of how in the hell did he pass? And I remember Matt Nyman's the guy's name, one of the team leaders, okay? I had a hate relationship with him. Luckily, we, uh, we made amends. Um, we became really, really good friends uh, until he passed, you know, so. But uh, he walked up to me and he said, Burke, I don't know how you did that, but there's nothing you can't do in this life now. If you can make it through the weekend, you just made it through and you still pass this, 
you'll be all right. And I was like, that was like the first time anybody had ever given me words of encouragement. You know, so made it through ranger school, got back from ranger school, uh, went to weapons squad, had a really good squad leader there, but I was very jaded. Um, so, you know, I feel bad for him at times, you know, because I just, I didn't, I still didn't care. Um, I'd made it through ranger school, but like, I just, I wasn't really willing to give it what it got. I was still counting down the days, you know, I'd prove people wrong, but I didn't want to do this. Like, I still just didn't really want to do it, you know? And then uh, I was actually in PLDC and everything changed. Um, the entire platoon got fired while I was in PLDC. They fired like all the squad leaders, all the team leaders, the platoon aren't like everything. And I remember because like, you know, I ran into one of the guys at the PX like on the weekend and stuff like that. And he's like, hey, are you tracking what's going on? I'm like, no, I don't have any idea what's going on. He's like, everybody's gone. <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, that's cool, good. Cause they all sucked anyway, you know? and. Um, so came back, they re, uh, reorganized the entire company, and I got this squad leader named Josh Wheeler. You know, Steph Sergeant Josh Wheeler. And I'll fast forward because I know I'm getting a little bit long here. I went from everybody that I talked about, like, and how I was, my mind frame was, and just hated the Army, hated everything about it, didn't really give a shit. Six months later, I'm a staff sergeant, I'm sorry, I'm a sergeant, you know, and I can, and I'm getting ready to reenlist, and I cannot imagine doing anything else with my life. And it's the power of one person. This non-commissioned officer named Josh Wheeler taught me what it meant to be a man, an NCO, a leader that cared about his people, because he did. I mean, just through and through, he was just a good human, and he cared, and he changed everything. And I could not imagine doing anything with my the rest of my life. The funny part about this is, is this is August 2001. Mm. And then the next month, we all know what happened. And that's it. You know? And, you know, but the fact that you met somebody prior to yep. having to experience combat that yep. you trusted, you believed in, that was that much of a mentor, yep. tremendous opportunity. I mean, opportunity in the sense, opportunity for you. Yeah to gain that type of leadership and exposure right before it mattered the most. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, you know, we see things that are going on with the army, the military, you know, life and everything else. And, you know, my takeaway from all that is, is listen, there, there, your people are out there. Unfortunately, if you don't have it right now, you're just going to have to exercise some patience. And here's the other thing. And this is like years later, like lots of reflection. I should have probably been more in tune to try to be that person for other people. I should have probably been a better leader because I'm not going to lie. I was not a great, you know, young corporal or sergeant. I, I mean, I was, I'm sure there was things that I was good at. Like I did care about my guys. Like I really did because I wanted to protect them, you know, and I made want to make sure they didn't suffer the same things I suffered. Um, you know, I did care, but did I train them? You know, did I do a lot of the things that I probably should have done? No, you know, training experts, you know, all this different kind of stuff. Cause I just didn't really care. Um, but I, I should have done more to be the leader that I wanted. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was nineteen twenty, like, you know, and I didn't really have good people that kind of, you know, showed me the way I'm not making excuses, but you know, maybe there should have been some more kind of intrinsic things that I realized, but like I, I already threw out the disclaimer. I'm not the smartest guy. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> the thing is though, is that the people that you first had that impact or sh you should have had an impact and had an imp impact on you maybe. Yeah are the people that were the worst in CO. So therefore your first introduction as much as this other guy, Josh wanted to be able to, to mold you into something and made such an impact on you. Those guys had already set what yep. was the standard now of your leadership. And it was probably hard for you to make that adjustment and it understand was. how, yeah, I could, I could totally see that. Yeah. And you know, and for everybody listening to, um, you get a chance, Google master Sergeant Josh Wheeler. Um, you know, he died. Uh, Silver Star recipient was a Delta Force, um, you know, and he's just an amazing human being and died a hero, died a hero, you know, um, and uh, there's not a day that it goes by that I don't think about him and the impact that he had on my life because he he just didn't impact me in the military either. Um, I bought my first house with his mentorship. I remodeled my first house with his mentorship, him and I put in my flooring, you know, 
carpet, rebuilding stuff, you know, same at his house, like helped me buy like my real first big boy vehicle. Like, I mean, you know, he, you know, helped me welcome my first son into the world, you know, and told me his principles of being a man, you know, or being a father, sorry. Like, I mean, the guy raised me. Like, you know, and, uh, well, you, it sounds like he had an impact, um, that lasted for many years. So you oh, stayed yeah. in contact with oh, him the whole yeah. service then. Yeah. Um, so when was it? It was, it was, it was around 2006, 2007 time frame, um, where he, he left Ranger Regiment, took the long walk, um, you know, went to Delta Force. Um, but we stayed in contact, not, not a lot, you know, I mean, we never, ever stay in contact, you know, especially during those time frames. you know, I mean, Jesus, you know, it was constant deployments and stuff, but we did. And every time we talked, it was incredibly impactful. Um, you know, and I mean, since we're talking about Josh, you know, and, and, you know, I know a lot that you guys talk about. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, in 2016, I'm a Ranger First Sergeant, uh, Charlie Company First Sergeant. We're at a major training exercise down in Fort Hunter, Liggett, and, um, or sorry, 2015. Um, and that's when Josh died. And there was a lot of things going on in my life at that time. Um, a lot of pressure. Uh, personally, you know, I was going through, I was still battling, you know, a custody battle with my kids. Um, my wife, my current wife, and I were battling a lot of things, external things, not obviously it was causing internal turmoil, but it was all these external factors. Um, had a battalion commander that I didn't get along with. And, you know, so there was a lot of first time in my life, like my ranger career was kind of in jeopardy because I just could not see eye to eye with this guy. Um, you know, just a lot of different things. And Josh, um, you know, Josh died. And, uh, you know, I remember where I was standing. I remember, you know, how I found out. Good friend of mine, Chris Frost, called me. Um, you know, it was one of those things because we we're in a brief. And, you know, so we're in a tent. All our cell phones are up in the um, uh, up in the front in the entrance, you know, in the con entry control point. We had to leave all our phones in there because, you know, the briefings were doing. And I walk out, and the, the guy standing there, he's one of my soldiers. He goes, hey, you know, first aren't your phone's been ringing off the hook. So I pick it up and I see Chris Frost, like, you know, 10 missed calls or whatever. And you, you know, you guys, unfortunately, you know, you guys have been, you know, around the military and in the military long enough, you know what that means. Like, you just know. You just don't know who at that point. Right. You know, so <clears throat> call Chris and, you know, I'm like, who? You know, and that's exactly how I answered the phone. Who? And he told me and it just, I couldn't function. Like, I just, I couldn't think. Like, I just, I, I, I didn't, I didn't know what to say. I, I think I actually just literally hung up on him. Like, I just hung up, like, you know, or dropped the phone. I, I, you know, I don't totally remember. Um, and I went down a dark place um, for, for, for a good two days, um, and which is not optimal when you're a Ranger First Sergeant um, in a very key validation exercise. <laughs> Um, luckily I had a really good company commander, um, and knew how, um, impactful this was for me. Cause I, I lucked out, you know, John Stahaley is actually a uh, one ninety one's a battalion commander now, just an absolute stud human being. Um, him and I worked together for four years straight. So when I came back to two seven five, we worked in the training team together. He was my OIC. I was the NCIC. So two years there, and then we went and took command together. It was awesome. So you know he knew how important Josh was to me because I talk about Josh. You know I tell most people. You know, and uh, so he kind of covered for me. You know he he you know he, he he tried to you know do the right thing and you know kind of shift some efforts, realign some things and stuff like that because I I, I just I couldn't function. Um. And the world just came down crashing on my shoulders. Um, and, you know, that was the third time in my life I thought about killing myself. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's, you know, when we talk about suicide, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, you got four kids. You have a wife that loves you, that you're going through all this shit. You know, you have an amazing career. You're a ranger first arm, for God's sakes, right? Like, you talk about the, 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 the pinnacle of people's career. You're selected for the SAR Major Academy. Like, you have all these things that are going for you. I understand you lost somebody that's near and dear to you, but why would you ever think about suicide? And what I, what I, when, I, when I talk about this, what I tell people is, is you're trying to think it through the lens of a rational mind. There's nothing. Somebody, when they're thinking and contemplating about suicide, there's nothing that's fucking rational no. going on in their mind. Everything 
is dire. Everything is bad. Everything. To include my wife. Like, that was a bad thing. Like, you know, that doesn't make it right. It's just the truth. Um, and that was the first time. So we are talking about being, you know, you know, 35 years old, 36 years old. And that was the first time I go, okay, yep. I can't do this alone. I need some help. <laughs> you know, 13 combat deployments, childhood trauma, okay. Loss of countless brothers and friends and everything else. Um, you know, all this stuff. And this is the first time I was like, yeah, okay. Yep. I can't do this. You know, and I, I remember I, you know, so I went to my chaplain and I said, Hey, I need some help. And he's like, okay. He's like, you know, I kind of heard that, you know, you lost somebody really, really close to you. I was like, yeah, it's a little bit of that. And then you guys have seen, uh, the movie, uh, shit, like all everywhere all at once. Okay. It's a shit show of a movie. Okay. It's uh, like about the multiverse for Marvel. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's like all these different timelines all at the same time. And she's like crossing all these parallel timelines. That's what I did to the chaplain. I was talking, I would one second be talking about trauma as a child. The next second I would be talking about watching one of my buddies die overseas. Then I would flash to something traumatic that happened with one of my children when I thought he had cancer and he almost died to, you know, th and I was like hopping timelines. And I don't know how long I vomited on this poor guy. Um, but I do remember him going, uh, uh, like, hold on one sec. Like, we're going to have to get some help here. And I'm like, that's what I'm fucking here for, dude. You know? And he's like, no, like, I'm going to need some help with this. Like, you're, there's so much here. I can't, like, even, like, he's like, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to start, like, all this. And that started, like, my, my journey, you know, to, um, you know, diving into things and to unpacking decades, a lifetime of trauma. Okay. Um, and, uh, it's probably, it was the hardest, smartest, dumbest, most traumatic thing I've ever done. Um, and it took a long time. Um, it was years. It took years. Um, you know, it was only until very recently within the last, you know, two or three years where I could say, um, I've worked through all that stuff and, uh, you know, I can, I can work through things and things can happen, um, where I can go, okay, I can, I can approach this with a, a stoic mindset, you know, or I can approach this, you know, with rational, you know, rational thought process. Um, but you know, that loss of Josh, man, the, he saved me one last time. He was there when I needed him the most and I didn't even fucking need it, know it. And he did it by dying. And it sucks to say it. And I've never, ever said this before. I've never said this before. I just had this like thought process, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, the life I live now is because of that moment. If that moment had not happened, I can promise you my life would not have went the way it went because the amount of things I was carrying well, I was so weighed down by life that there is no way we would have got where we would have got without some, and maybe, maybe something else would have happened and it would have had a similar result, but you know, we never know, right? We never know. Um, but, uh, yeah. So sorry, <clears throat> there was a lot there. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> just, yeah. My question is, um, just from that moment where yeah. you, for your terms, you vomited on the chaplain. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you, you gave him all this information. Yeah. How did that affect your leadership style moving forward after you? Yeah. You, you yeah. because you know vulnerability. Question, yeah. Vulnerability in the military yeah. is not a good thing. Absolutely. You're not supposed to go to sick call. You're not supposed to say something hurts. Yeah. Drink water. Yeah. Take an ibuprofen. Take a knee. Head on. So yeah. how did your leadership style change from that point? Yeah. Moving forward. God, what a good question, Kyle. That is that is like amazing. At first, nothing. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. Like, I didn't really change that much as a first sergeant. I was probably more empathetic, like to certain situations when guys would have issues. Okay, um, you know, like I had an issue. Or, you know, I had a guy that came in um, that was really struggling with, you know, his girlfriend, you know, that left him, and the circumstances behind it, and all this stuff. Normally, as a first sergeant, I probably would have been like, 
dude, shut up. There's plenty of women out there. Like, why are you focusing on her? Like, move on with your life. But I remember, like, I sat down and I was like, okay, man. Like, hey, man, I'm really sorry. Because, you know, like, let's talk about this. Like, how can we work through this, you know, and everything. I was def- I was probably immediately more empathetic, you know, within the, you know, that first little period. But for the most part, I was still that callous asshole for the most part. But a year at the academy, one of the worst years of my life. Okay. Um, because, you know, going from all of that deployment, another deployment, um, then rapidly coming out of position and then, you know, going to the Star Major Academy where you're not in charge of anybody. Because here's a key point. Sorry. I, I do want to divert just for one you're minute. Good. We tend to deflect our personal baggage and our personal issues um, and we mask it by being a leader. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier to focus on your shit. Okay, let's imagine you're one of my guys, yeah. right? I'm just going to focus on the problems. I'm like, Kyle, man, he's got all this yeah. shit going on, right? Like, God, he's fucked up, you know? And, and I don't have to worry about mine because I'm too busy talking about yours, right? Yeah. Um, so you can just do that as a leader. Well, when you go to the Star Major Academy, you're in charge of no one. You got nothing to worry about. Do some papers, you know, show up to PT once in a while and it's lame as shit. Um, and that's it. You got more time than you know what to do with. Guess what? That's the problem. You've got more time than what you know what to do with. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I did a lot of reflection. <clears throat> I did a lot of thinking. Um, I did a lot of talking. I did a lot of counseling. Um, my wife and I, we duked it out a lot. Um, we had to fight through a lot of things. Um, and, and that really honestly continued until... I was a squadron CSM over at Second Cavalry Regiment, and then to I'm, I'm answering I'm gonna answer your question now. That's when my, I realized my leadership style changed um, because all that stuff that happened, I'd had time to think about it. I'd had time to deep dive into everything that made Mike Burke who Mike Burke was up until that point, and I went I and then also because I'm no longer in Ranger Regiment where Rangers are just known for sucking it up as long as they possibly have to to finish what they need to do and doing it well okay that's like a ranger you know um and i'm in a completely different organization made up of completely different individuals and i don't mean that like disparagingly they're just different it's just different it's different mind frames and i said well my leadership style has got to change anyway i can't be ranger mike anyway um so how am i going to approach this and uh straight up gonna steal a line from human barnett uh, you guys heard of Yuma Barnett, by the way? Got to have him on this podcast. No. Okay. I'll, I'll link you up. Yuma Barnett, I'm going I'm to steal, like, leading with vulnerability and transparency. Nice. When I would sit down with guys, uh, gals, when I would talk about hard issues, I would talk about leadership, when, when I would teach, when I would mentor, when I would develop, I would do, through, do so from a position of vulnerability and relating to them, showing them, hey, I understand why you're struggling because I've been through something similar. So now that we have this shared understanding, here's what I can teach you and here's what I can show you so that you can basically jumpstart your leadership or whatever journey we're talking about and not have to suffer the way I suffered because straight up, I just suffered through life. Like if I'm just being honest with you, when I look at my life, I just suffered through it a lot and I just kept on going just just okay all right well that's another really really shitty the thing that happened oh your best friend roommate that you grew up with as an nco was killed yeah that sucks let's get drunk as shit at his funeral okay vomit all over behind the freaking bar you know in helena montana and then let's go back let, okay let's get back and let's go deploy you know never ever think about it again or just, you know, only time you do is when you're going to laugh about some stupid thing that Casey Casavan did. You know, that's a friend I was talking about. You know, and just suffered through things. And uh, realized that that's just a terrible way to lead life. And uh, so I definitely showed a hell of a lot more empathy and sympathy with individuals. I learned to lead with vulnerability um, and transparency as a leader in all ways. That, hey, I'm not this superhuman person. I have more problems than you can imagine um i struggle the same way you struggle um but here i am and i'm 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 prepared to go hand in hand with you and help you through this and we do that as leaders by nature 
but there's this thing that while well, you can't show weakness um you know we we have to you know never let them see us suffer you know um and it, it's just a terrible way to lead because the burden it puts on you but the level of unapproachability that it creates for you um you know there's there's too much approachability like you don't want to get too comfortable and there's definitely um there is a risk with being transparent because people will be uh, use it against you. And, uh, you know, I, I have thought through that a lot and I've, I've just had to accept the good with the bad because there is bad things. You know, the example I'll use is, is we're sitting around and we're talking about suicide awareness. Okay. Mental resiliency at second Calvary regiment. This was shortly over after I took over as a regimental CSM over at second Calvary regiment. And, uh, you know, so we had this working group, you know, a bunch of individuals in the room and we were talking about how we wanted to, you know, cause we are having a lot of, you know, we had a kid that right before I took over, um, you know, committed suicide, um, you know, and there was just a lot of stuff happening over there in Germany in the arena of suicide, you know, suicide attempts and everything else. So, you know, we decided, Hey, okay, we're going to, you know, take a proactive approach about this, you know, we're going to really kind of get to the heart of the matter. And, you know, everybody was trying. And I'm not mad at him. You know, everybody was, you know, throwing out good ideas and stuff. And I just remember I looked at my regiment commander. I was like, hey, this is all bullshit. You know, he's one of my best friends, Colonel Thomas Hove. And he's like, oh, okay, Sergeant Major, um, do you care to give me a little bit more? <laughs> you know, like, you know, you're just throwing around random statements. And I'm like, yeah, like, this is not going to get through to people. We've got to immediately start whatever event or whatever we're doing with snapping people into the moment and grabbing their attention and grabbing them by the throat, smacking them off the table and then saying, pay the fuck attention. This is a serious issue and we need to talk about it because, because my mind frame and it still stands is when we talk about suicide. Okay. We talk about sexual harassment or sexual assault. Okay. We talk about those two things. The hardest thing a human being can ever have to do. I'm sure there's others. Okay. I'm sure there's plenty of others, but the hardest thing that they can ever have to do is come to another adult or even worse, their leader and say, I'm, I am in such a bad place. I no longer think I want to live or I was sexually assaulted. Okay. How do you break through that? How do you establish that level of trust with your teammates, with your, as a leader, like you've got to really break down some huge barriers, some huge walls. And I don't totally remember how it kind of came about, but I basically, what the, what I said was, how about I record a video, um, where I talk about my struggles and I talk about my suicidal attempts. And, you know, my regiment commander, you know, being just the absolute best buddy, you know, said, you sure you want to do that? Like, man, that's, that's like a really, you're the regimental sergeant major, man. You want to throw yourself out there? And I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Like, I absolutely don't want to do it, but I but we need to do it. So basically I scripted it out, you know, and I talked about, um, you know, some of the trauma, um, abuse that I suffered as a child. Um, talked about the first time I uh, attempted to kill myself when I was 12, again, when I was 16. Um, and then, you know, the story I told about Josh Wheeler. Um, and I just outlined all the trauma of my life and how I made it through it and how I pushed, you know, I pushed through some of it and then I worked through the rest of it. And that, you know, you're looking at me as your regimental SAR major. Okay. And you gotta, I, and I, please don't like think I'm like trying to be like some egocentric kind of guy, but I am a ranger, ranger. Okay, that had spent 17 years in Ranger Regiment, and now I'm in charge of a striker brigade. Like, I'm one of like 12 people that have their Ranger tab outside of the officers, like in the whole goddamn regiment of 4,500 people, you know? And there's always like just myths and, you know, stigmas that come along with that. Like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the dude, you know, right? And, uh, so we recorded this video because at first I was going to kind of like do it in front of every single one of the squadrons, you know, leading into the event for the day. But we're like, I don't think I can make it through this like seven times, you know. So we recorded a video with the PAO, Ellen Brabo. Um, I still thank you. She was a PAO at the time. She was just absolute awesome. She helped me through it and took, I don't even know how long it took us to do the damn thing. Um, and it was about, you know, three minutes long. And it was a start to basically a day that was structured around and we had a bunch of different events where they would just, they were forced to talk and they were supposed forced to talk about very difficult things, 
hard things, sexual assault, sexual harassment, indicators for how those things, environments that lead to that kind of stuff, signs and symptoms and what causes people to reach a level of committing suicide and everything else, like forced to talk about this stuff in small teams, larger teams, you know, and really just get into this. But this video was the opening thing. Okay. I will tell you, it took about two weeks to get through everybody, you know, just because of timing and it's a very, very busy unit. So like when standing them down for two weeks, I was like, uh, probably damn near like an act of Congress. Like it was a huge deal. Right. Um, tons of amazing feedback, people walking up to me with tears in their eyes. Okay. Um, people walking up to my wife being like, I can't believe your husband did that. Like, that is amazing. He's such a strong guy, like, but he's been through all this shit. Like, but then we also had the people and some of them higher in leadership. I guess I'm in the, out of the military now, so I guess I could say it, um, you know, colonels, uh, generals and senior SAR majors that said, uh, this guy should not be the regimental SAR major. Yeah. Really? They, oh, yeah. So yeah. it was the backlash that oh, you yeah. were, uh, your commander was trying to tell you at that time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that, you know, he shouldn't be a SAR major. Like, if he's had all these mental issues, like, why the hell is he in command? Like, that doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't make sense. And, uh, you know, we, we sorted through it. And Colonel Hof, you know, and I don't even know, like, I'll never know. I mean, he would never tell me unless I just directly asked him. You know, I'm sure he had a million backdoor conversations that I just don't even know about where he came to my fight, you know, fight for me, okay? Um, but uh, there was plenty of people, and they're my own soldiers too. My own soldiers were like, you know, this guy, you know, you know, he's basically a pussy. You know, like, why the hell is he in position? You know, if he's got all these mental health rage, you know, and then there's the people that are just uninformed. They're like, yeah, he chaptered that guy out for having mental health issues. What a hypocrite. That's not fucking true, first off. Like, that, <laughs> that, that's not. I've never chaptered. First off, I've never chaptered anybody because I'm a sergeant major. I don't have the authority to. I just make recommendations, but I've never made the recommendation. Well, that guy has mental health issues. Let's kick him out of the army. Like, that's not how that conversation goes, you know. No. But, uh. At the end of the day, you know, many years later, you know, this was 19, you know, 2019, um, people still reach out to me. Like even like probably, I, I think within the last week I was talking to a guy on Facebook Messenger that talk, was talking about that video and how huge of an impact it made on his life. So my point is, is that there was good and then there, there was bad, but there was more good. Maybe there was, maybe there's not, maybe there was more bad. I just don't know about it. Um, but there was more good than bad. So it was worth it. And I threw myself out there. I'm sure that I dropped a notch in people's respect. Um, but you know what? I don't give a shit. <laughs> because if it saved one person's exactly. life, but it came at the cost of 50 people that think I'm a piece of shit, okay, cool. I'm glad I saved your life. You can all fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know? um, but that, it's a difficult thing to do. You know, and, and, and the, the real tough part is, is, you know, I was able to, you know, and I'm not naive to the fact that I was able to do that from a position of a lot of respect. I, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I had a shitload of street credit, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. you know, like, you know, and I'm not trying to be arrogant about it, but I did, you know, I mean, 14 combat deployments, you know, Ranger tabs, our major, you know, all this stuff. Like I can't, I, 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 okay. So, you know, PL, you know, that's joining the army, you know, butter bar. Yeah. Okay. You probably can't do the same thing, man. Like, you know, to the same degree, like it's just not going to work as well. I, I, I did do it from a position of a shitload of respect, you know, yeah. in, in street credit. Well, the um, guys that I've seen or have said very similar stories that what you're describing about were actually guys who were in the platoon or in the company. And it was their first sergeant that actually came forward and said, yeah. hey, listen, I've gone out and got help and um, gone through therapy or whatever the case may be. And you guys need to do a check, you know, and you need to make sure that you're getting things yeah. right at the home place and that you're doing these things. And again, a powerful message. So. I hope that we've gotten to a better place. I'm sad to hear that it was 2019, 20, and you know, not that long ago when no. you think about it. But um, I hope we've gotten to a better place within the military where we're able to allow our NCOs and our leaders to step forward and be vulnerable in that way because absolutely that's going to be impactful. It's going to be, there's going to be a private out there listening to that and going, man, I, you know, now I, I see somebody that's like me. There may be somebody listening to this episode, actually, it's going to go, 
oh wow you know if he if he went through all of that and and uh, had all those challenges and made it out the other side then then certainly i can as well you know and and i think that's powerful i appreciate it yeah i mean i'll never i'll always find a reason to tell that story i think um you know in those those vignettes because i realize i realize now like many years later like the cost and how disassociated with life I was um, because of this mask that I wore um, and how just I just powered through things. I was not in tune with other people's emotions because, you know, that's like the thing too. Like somebody's emotional and if you, in order to totally empathize with them, you got to kind of get to that level. And I wasn't, I, if I did that, I knew that there was some wall that was going to break and then, you know, there potentially could be, you know, an aftermath and I was never prepared to do that. So I would never really get in tune with people and, you know, and now just sitting here, like thinking about this, like just even a little bit more. And as you were kind of talking, Rob, <clears throat> the other thing I realized is a, is a huge point to all that was, <clears throat> sorry, a huge point to that all was uh, my wife, so Sarah. You know, we met in 2011, and she was the per first person that I ever really opened up to. Like, like not, like, you know, girl. Like, I mean, ever. Like, she was the first person I really talked to about everything. And I don't know why. Like, I can't totally explain it. But, and... I, you know, through the years, you know, you go through the years, I just became more and more comfortable, not only with talking with her about the things and the things I was struggling with and her being okay with that, not judgmental for it, I think is what led to me being able to do that, you know, years later and open up to more people and then, you know, take the stance, you know, but it was not a quick journey. It was not easy. Um, and it's probably, you know, I mean, you know, you got the two thirds, one third rule, right? You know, so lived for 36 years, you know, and it took me 10 years to work through it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a little bit less, but you get my point, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, so, you know, it, uh, but so, you know, not only that, but this belief that, you know, you just got to keep on powering through it. No, man, like as things happen, you got to find a way to deal with them. You got to find a way to work through them. You got to find a way to, um, um, talk about them because building up, letting them build up for years and years and decades and decades, I do not recommend that. And I would not wish that on my worst enemy. You know, the thing, the period I went through my, in my life for about two to three years, I, I like, whew, whew, holy shit, man. Yeah, that was bad. That was really bad. Not recommended, not recommended, but we are making a difference in the military. We are changing, I believe. Um, but it's, it's, it's a slippery slope, and it's tough because, yes, we want you to talk about things. Yes, we want you to tell us what's wrong. Yes, we want, you know, when bad things happen, we want you to talk about it. But also at the t same time, we want you to be able to conduct violence at the drop of a hat and take <laughs> the life of another human being. Right. Like... <laughs> Is, is there, is, you know, it's, it's two very different messages, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, you can, where you can wear, a no, sorry. This is like a first for me. So now like I can kind of talk about it. Yeah, totally. You can totally look like a pageant queen. You can have fingernails, you can braid your hair, like, you know, you can wear makeup and all this stuff, but Hey, also I'm going to need you to slit this person's throat and be prepared to do this. You know, and people make the argument, well, they're just a pack clerk. They're never, shut the fuck up. Like, straight up. Okay? Like, anybody that says, well, they're just a pack clerk or, shut up. Okay? Go read a history book. Talk about total war. Yeah. Just go read a book, for God's sake, please. Okay? There is nothing, there is no such thing as front lines, back lines you know, rear echelon and everything else. We were led to believe that because of fobs, you know, and all this stuff in the GWAT. Yeah. But when you're talking about war on a theater, there's no such thing. Yeah. I mean, think, think about the truck drivers, the 88 mics and the ambushes. Yeah. Exactly. As an example, just one example. Yeah. The, the example I would always include is Jessica Lynch. Yes. Yep. Right. You know, Absolutely. I mean, the first time I went to training with my FST, which is Ford support company. Okay. They were doing convoy training and, uh, 
that's a that's a story within itself. I'll, I'll just give the wave tops. But like, so I go out there, and you know, they drive all their vehicles out there. They're doing simulator training, and then you know, because they're gonna try to eventually do convoy training. And I'm just like looking at the vehicles, and I'm like, wait, like, how are you guys gonna do convoy training? Like, there's no guns on these vehicles. There's no wait. Like, I look even more, and I'm like, there's not even ring mounts. There's like nothing. How are you gonna mount guns on here? How are you gonna do convoy training? They're like, well, you know, we don't, we don't have guns. We have, we'll have gun jeeps, you know, in the front, in the back, you know, Humvees. And I'm like, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, why would we do that? Why do we not have guns on every goddamn vehicle? Like, well, you know, they're going to be in the, like, and so I would always bring up Jessica Lynch and I would tell that story, you know, and I would tell the ugly truths about Jessica Lynch, you know, and that whole mission about how people did not fire their weapons. Okay. Could not defend themselves because their weapons were inoperable. Okay, um, and there's plenty of guys from 175 that can talk about that, that dug up the bodies, you know, like um, Yuma Barnett's one of them. Okay, um, you know, so they can they can talk about that stuff in detail, um, you know. Um, but anyway, the point being is, is like I would talk about that. Like you have to be prepared at any moment. At the end of the day, if you join the military, your job is to eliminate the, the enemies of our country. Okay, and that might mean that you need to literally do it with your hands. You might need to literally do it with a weapon. If you're not prepared for that, then go be a firefighter. Go be a cop, okay? Go do something different. You need to be prepared and you need to be training for that if you are in our military. Because the truth is, is that it's going to happen. We are going to be in something how soon when it happens who the hell knows you yeah know? but at the end of the day to our core that is the purpose of the army the purpose of the army is nothing more than that war is not beautiful it is not a beauty pageant okay it's not cute it's not glamorous it's fucking disgusting and you need to be able to pull violence out of your ass in a way that most human beings cannot even possibly understand at the drop of a hat and you will never ever rise to the level of your expectations you will fall to the level of your conditioning so if you're not conditioned to do that violence and you're not comfortable to do that violence then what do you think is going to happen you're going to die and your friends are going to die and that's worse your friends dying is worse than you dying in my opinion that's the way i've always thought about it like if i die okay i'm dead it's just I guess everybody else moves on with their life and they're like, they tell stories about me, you know, and how big of a dick I was and they drink beers, right? But if I live and my friends die and it's a result of me not being able to do that, I don't think I could live with that. Yeah. I don't think I could live with that, you know? So, um, yeah. I Sorry, wanna, that's like a very... <laughs> oh, no, no, that's perfectly fine. So oh. You said you didn't want to get dark and gloomy. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> well, and, and, and we talked about it a little bit, you know, uh, earlier, and, and you were talking about your dark spots, and, and we probably all had our, our demons and stuff and our dark um, times in our lives. And um, But I also want to talk about you rose to the highest level. You talked about being a regimental sergeant major and, you know, and doing those types of things, but... What was the transition like then? Because that could have been, yeah. it, it, if I'm not sure what happened. So I'm really curious about this because a lot of people were really concerned about me as I was making that transition. Um, I decided to go back and get my master's degree. And honestly, I think that's what helped me because by going to school at night, I was able to sit around with individuals who were um, out there already in the private sector. And so I was kind of like transitioning over a period of time. But someone like you who may not, and I'm, that's why I'm curious about, yeah. had that opportunity to really decompress. What was that like when you walked out the door? You're talking about the military as a whole. Yes. Right? Okay. So a lot of, uh, I did find a, a lot of ways to decompress. And I, I would love to tell you that like I did it like strategically, because, but I didn't. Because I came out of Europe, okay? So I came out of a 2nd Cavalry Regiment with a plan. Uh, Sergeant Major Abernathy, I don't know if you know him or not. Um, Sounds familiar. Yeah, UCOM CSM now, mm -hmm. okay? He was a user of CSM at the time. Uh, as Force Com CSM, Sergeant Major Sims, uh, phenomenal human beings. Um, you know, they basically sat me down, you know, as I was reaching the tender there, and they're like, hey, what's next for you? And I was like, I don't know. 
Like, I don't know, you know? And so they basically sat me down and they gave me some mentorship and everything else. They're like, bottom line is, is if you want to be competitive as an OMSAR major, you want to continue to rise through the echelons of being a SAR major, here's what you need to do. Um, and so that's why I took, you know, first SVAP because they're like, everybody in Europe knows who you are. Okay. Everybody behind the brown fence, because that's where you spent most of your career knows who you are, but no one knows who you are in the rest of the army. And if you're going to be competitive, people kind of, kind of know your name, you know, and know who you are and know, you know, the results you produce. So go to first SVAB, be under force com, and you'll have multiple touch points throughout the army because of the nature of the mission. I was like, okay, cool. Well, wait, before you go yeah, further, yeah. some people are going to be looking at this and going, what's first SVAB? Cause yeah. I get asked people, uh, yeah, yeah. to pr- call out the acronym. So yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry <laughs> that's right. That. And that's not one that you normally hear yeah, that yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, first security assistance brigade. Okay. And, uh, there's five total brigades, one national guard brigade. Um, and they are an advisory cell uh, that works across the, the, um, the globe. Um, and they're aligned to COCOM. And their primary mission is advising partners on strategic, you know, uh, strategic missions. Um, you know, that have to do with logistics and just all of sort of different things. Um, they're, they're a very good complement to the SF mission. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, so I took that job and... The plan was like, take that job, do it for one year, maybe a little bit longer, and then start competing, do interviews and, you know, rise through the ranks as a CSM, you know, one star, two star, three star, four star, right? You know, and, you know, SMA, you know, hey, if you're going to do it, do it right, right? You know, don't fuck around. Let's get it done. And that was a plan. And, uh, you know, it changed my mind. Just there's a, there's just a million things. We don't have enough of a podcast, you know, probably don't have enough, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, real, we'll, we'll have you back again, yeah, Mike, yeah, for sure. Yeah, You're yeah. local, so it's too yeah, easy. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, to, to, to tell you how I kind of came to the decision. But bottom line is, is very quickly I said, all right, you know what? I'm getting out. Like, I'm getting out of the Army. And, uh, and then, you know, so I made that decision. It took another year for me to convince my wife that, I, that it was okay for me to get out of the Army because she was not thrilled. Like, straight up, she was like, we came here because this is the plan, and now you're telling me that you don't want to do that? She was not okay with that. Like, wow, that seems like very different. I would was, have been yeah. Yeah, thinking yeah, more yeah, yeah, like, yeah. good, you need to get out. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired yeah. of deployments. Well, and- you know, you got to understand from her perspective, like there was this whole plan laid out, you yeah. know, and, uh, and I'm changing it, you know, and then the fear of like, well, now you can move anywhere you want in the world. Like, where do you go? You know, so all these different kind of things. Um, but what, once I kind of made the decision what I credit with my ability to, uh, to transition was everything else I was doing in my life. So at the time I'm running, you know, always in pursuit podcast. We're doing blogs with that. We're having a lot of different conversations. I'm doing like, you know, different kind of speaking things that are forcing me to have different conversations and, uh, you know, some stuff, local community, like I'm, you know, I'm just forcing myself to get out of the military box and I'm creating like, a different Mike Burke than Sergeant Major Mike Burke. So, and then, you know, about six months before retirement, I make this decision that I am not going to do what most people do in my position. And I'm not mad at any of them. They, they do whatever they want to do. Whatever they think they need to do, that's perfectly fine. You know, go work for some defense industry, you know, doing something. I made the decision I'm not doing that. If I'm going to separate from the military, I'm not going to immediately go and be back with the military, right? Um, Which is scary as shit. Like, let's just be honest here, okay? Just because you're in the military, (laughs) like, doesn't, you know, and you're at this senior level does not mean that you can go into civilian world and be that successful. No, you go from sergeant major to nobody. Yeah, Yeah. right? Exactly. And uh, so... I did, you know, I lined up just a lot of different conversations, a lot of, I seek out a lot of mentorship and some of my best mentors have never served a day in the military. Okay. And they, but they're good, you know, checks for me. You know, they, they make me realize things and they make me go, Hey, you need to have this conversation a different way. I'm like, okay, yeah, cool. You know? And, uh, so I just forced myself to be very uncomfortable, you know, with all that kind of stuff and going, I'm going to have to redefine myself. You know, the, the, the saying, you know, the book and everything else, what got you here is not going to get you there. Like, okay, if I'm going to be able to do this, I've got to become a different version of myself. And, you know, I was kind of forced to do that too, because the, 
you know, the kind of the mantra behind Always in Pursuit podcast was you're constantly evolving. You're constantly changing who you are. So, you know, I kind of had to practice that, you know. And uh, just through discussions, all this different kind of stuff, um, you know, I got on to this, uh, you know, you should be a chief of staff. A chief of staff is very based off somebody with your background and being a SAR major and a lot of different things, that would actually be a good civilian jump for you. And uh, so I did a, a lot of different interviews. I've interviewed with a lot of companies. Um, I got, you know, the one offer with Northern Rock, um, with Logan Leslie, who's an SF guy. And uh, that was the, the, the leading offer, not only um, just because of him, but then also just the opportunity behind it and everything else. I was like, okay, like it was always the winner, but like, I just, you know, you know, just kind of that you always make sure you're like, well, let's just make sure I'm making the right choice. Like, I'm not going to go with the first option that was presented to me. Let me look into everything. Um, but it was the opportunity that I went with. Um, but it wasn't easy, you know, and I definitely had to shut up like a lot. You know, so I've been there about six months now and I just needed to learn to listen like all the time. Um, I needed to learn that I'm not the decision maker anymore. Um, I got to build trust before I can make decisions, which is really weird for me as a SAR major in first SAR and in NCO growing up in a Ranger regiment. Like that's who makes all the damn decisions. Okay. <laughs> like, and it depended on the commander that you have you're definitely the guy making all the decisions. Like, I can't do that. Like, because I just don't have enough experience. I don't have enough context because I don't know enough about what's going on to sit there and just make decisions for it. And I got to do a lot of staff work too. Like, okay. Like, and I got to be the doer, you know, and I got to do all this different kind of stuff. And I got to be comfortable sitting in a room with investors, chief, of, you know, um, chief financial officer that, you know, is freaking super experienced, been doing it for 25 years, managing multi-billion dollar accounts, you know, a CMO that used to work for AT&T and all these major brands and everything else. And all these different people that, you know, have tons of corporate experience and I've got to be comfortable in there. And listening is the key and not trying to inject war stories while back in the military, you know, like, rah, 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 like, no, like be relatable and go, okay, hey, I totally understand what you're saying. You know, here's some thoughts that I would, you know, provide for that. Um, you know, maybe here's how we can actually offer some structure, not necessarily military structure, but some structure so that we can be more efficient with the time, you know, and just do that slowly. But most importantly, build trust over and over and over again, communicate over and over and over again, you know, and I'm still working through it. I'm mean, just being honest with you. Like I'm like the, the, you know, Mike has not been successful in the civilian world quite yet. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's one piece of it, but it was very, very scary. Um, it was very, I, I had a lot of trepidations. I mean, I will tell you even probably the first month, you know, going up there to Northern rock, you know, and, and, and sitting in that office, I'm like, man, I think I fucked up, like, you know, like, I don't know if I should have done this, you know, like I could, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if I called daily defense, if they'd hire me, you know, like I'm, I'm serious, you know, because like, I'm comfortable there, you know, uh, well, you know, I could always call this guy, you know, that I know, you know, and he would hire me, you know, and that'd be super comfortable, you know, or I could go, you know, do these contracts, you know, like, you know, and, uh, but now, you know, we're kind of hitting, I don't want to say we're comfortable, but you know, we're definitely getting a rhythm and I'm going, okay, I'm actually add value. Okay, I'm actually doing things. And, uh, you know, Kyle and I were talking a little bit before, Rob, why, you know, and I know you were listening, but, you know, we, one thing we were talking about is, is, you know, and this just, man, I'm, I'm still working through this process, okay? Like, I'm still kind of, like, navigating things, but, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my wife says, hey, stop at the Sharpsburg uh, uh, Pizza and Pub. You know, by the way, if everybody's local, great pizza. Go stop <laughs> by. Shout out to them. Um, but, uh, you know, she said, hey, stop, grab pizza. Uh, I ordered it, you know, and you're, and you're driving by because I was driving home from work. So I stopped there and I look inside and I'd actually never been in there. We'd order pizza from there all the time, but I'd never been in there. I was like, ah, oh, they got a bar. All right, cool. So I went into the bar, set up at the bar, Yingling. Oh man, today's going to be a good day, right? Order a Yingling and I'm sitting there and I'm just watching like these people, you know, and I'm just people watching and people are having all these conversations and they're talking about stuff. And I just remember one, like, you know, particular conversation, you know, I just remember having this thought, like, who gives a shit? Like, 
really? You guys are really, like, really intent about having this dumbass conversation about it? Do you realize there's people dying in Ukraine right now? Like, you know, like, and that matters, you know? Anyway, my point being is, is I had, like, this moment, you know, and I think I've said, like, I've had a lot of these throughout my life, is, oh, shit. There is nothing normal about me. From my upbringing when I was born to a 16-year-old girl that's family abandoned them, living pretty much on the streets, okay, tossed around foster care to foster care so she could work, um, to the things that happened through me throughout my life, to Ranger Regiment, even my Ranger Regiment story in the beginning, you even said was different, you know? Yeah. To 9-11, to the deployments, to the kinetic times that we talk about that from like 2005 to 2011 that were fucking madness every damn day, to divorces, to children, to blended marriages, to being a CSM, you know, watching the world and all the things that's happened and having to do it from the lens of being in the military to here and now in Sharpsburg, well, we're in Sonoy right now, Georgia, like none of that is normal, but that's okay. That's my journey. That's my story. And I just have to be okay with the fact that I'll sit in a room and there's not a fucking person in there that gets me and that's okay it's not their fault and just enjoy your yingling and just enjoy my yingling <laughs> and go <laughs> I love i'm that. gonna drink this beer i'm gonna go home my family's gonna be excited to see me because i have pizza not me they're excited about the pizza <laughs> <laughs> no i'm just kidding and i'm just gonna sit around on a friday night watch the storm come in and just be okay with it be the person you used to protect exactly but that's not a like that's not normal and i one of my great buddies just left okay he was up here for the week he's doing skill bridge with northern rock and we we had this amazing conversation and what we realized about being in the military and why sometimes we struggle is you think about being in the military okay like just go back like we're in the uniform okay and maybe even if it's a little bit more helpful, go back to like the time that you remember where it was like, I'm getting ready to fucking deploy again, okay? Or I'm getting ready to go on another training exercise. And what I realized was, and what our, I'm sorry, what we kind of realized is, is you live your life task-based. I got to get ready for this training exercise. I got to make sure the platoon's ready for this. I got to get ready for this next deployment. So when you go home, you're like, okay, we have the weekend. We're going to do this on Friday night. Saturday, I need to make sure that I spend some quality time with my wife. I, I make sure I spend quality time with all my kids. I'm going to take them to the movie on Saturday night. Sunday morning, we're going to get up. We're going to go to church. I'm going to make them breakfast. And then we're going to get, and we're going to do Sunday chores. I'm going to help them with their homework. And then ba 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 because Monday, we got final prep and everything else because Thursday, we're out the door. And you live your life like that. It's always task-based. There's always something you got to get done. Even having sex with your wife, okay? <laughs> because you're like, I, only have, I can only do this five more times yep. before I deploy, okay? And it might be the last time I ever have sex with my wife, okay? Um, or... You know, depending on what unit you're in or how your military career was, you also have this perpetual thing in the back of your head. You never know when the shoe's going to drop and you're going to have to leave in the middle of the night and you might never see your family again because you're going to get deployed for a surge or for a rapid deployment or whatever is going to happen in the world, right? You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. I could sit down with you gentlemen, record an amazing podcast, I'm probably going to go next door and have a beer afterwards because you guys have been telling me about the beer. My son's in town for a couple more days before he goes to college. I told him we'd do whatever he wanted, you know, later today. That There's no expectation there. Shit, we might do it tomorrow. And if we don't, well, we're still going to hang out. Shit, maybe I'll tell him to come drink a beer with us. Okay? There you go. See? Because next, a couple weeks from now, I'm probably going to fly up 
and hang out with him at his college campus. Or maybe I'll do it next month. I don't know. We'll see. It's weird keeping it organic, isn't it? It is. It's so weird. Because I've never done it. Ever. So my, my, my tip to everybody, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if it's been conditioned for four years, 30 years, whatever. Like, just, it's going to be all right, man. Just be comfortable being with yourself. Be comfortable doing the things that you love without the expectation that you got to hurry up and finish them because you got to do this next thing. You don't have to do shit. You don't have to do any of it. You can do whatever you want. Like my wife, you know, I'm putting, I'm working on a project gun right now. And my wife, like, at first she's like, why is all this stuff like coming to the house? She's like, I'm like, because I've always wanted to have a project gun. I've always wanted to build a gun. She's like, really? Why? I'm like, I've just always wanted to do it. She's like, you've never, ever said it before. I was like, because I never, ever, well, one, I didn't have the money. But <laughs> two, like, <laughs> two, I just never had the time. In any time that was with my family, I wanted to make it about my family. Like, I literally sold my motorcycle. I had a Harley Dyna Glide 2004. I literally sold it because I felt guilty about ever going and riding it. Because that was, uh, you know, taken away from my yeah, family. Yeah, taking away those critical moments that you did get. Yeah, okay. those few. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, if I want to wake up and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to go mountain biking. I'll see you guys maybe around lunch. I don't have to feel bad about it. <laughs> like, yeah. I'll see you tonight. Like, it'll be all right. I'll see you Monday night. You know, like, it's going to be okay. But that's so weird. Like, and we're just not used to that, you know? So, sorry. I'm going on no, and on. No, 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 it's totally fine. Um, what I do want to do is um, ask you two questions before we wrap up, because yeah. I do want to have you on the show again. That would be honest. Um, I think if we got Sean and him together and talked about SFAB and stuff like that. just let them go. Which we haven't had a chance to really cover that deeply. Uh, and we, user discretion. And, 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 well, so <laughs> you, you did mention that initially yeah. about how um, there's a lot of good and bad, and so that's what I'd love to cover. Um, but two things. Yes, sir. What would you give as an advice to somebody who's coming into the military? And then what are you going to say to the guy who is getting out? Yeah. Yeah. So first, uh, the guy going into the military, and this is completely relatable. I was sharing this with you. Just make a decision and go. You'll figure it out in flight. Don't worry about it. You're not prepared. You're just not. I don't care what you're doing. You're not prepared. Do the best you can with the information that you're provided. Don't fucking listen to anybody else. Because even, I even tell my son this, you know, when at one point he was thinking about going to Range Regiment, I'm like, I'm the wrong person to talk to. He's like, yeah, but you lived it for all these years. I'm like, yeah, that was a long time ago. Like, it's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm not the right guy. Go talk. I'll, I'll line it up. You go talk to them. Don't listen to anybody else. You just got, you're going to, there's even, okay, I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, Delta Force selection, okay? So I went to that. I was not successful, obviously. Um, but, you know, there's tons of books about it. There's all kinds of information about it. You can literally find stuff and tells you, it tells you exactly what you're going to do every single day. And you know what? It doesn't fucking matter. I was going to say, <laughs> it's called a selection for a reason. The whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The whole idea is for you to experience it at that moment and for them yeah. to assess you yeah. at that time. Yeah. As well. it, it doesn't matter. You could know the exact route you're going to walk every day and it wouldn't matter. You're still got to do it. And you still got to figure it out on the fly. So don't sit there and have decision constipation. Just do it. Just go. Whatever you're thinking about doing, just go. Pull the trigger. Make it happen. You'll figure it out along the way. Learn to have confidence in your ability to figure things out because you're going to have to do that. And that's going to be actually part of your success in the military. So actually creating situations where you just got to kind of figure things out uninformed is actually the key and the recipe to success of being in the military. For the person that getting out, one, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to get out. Get out now, right now. Get out of the army. Get out of the military. Life is better on the other side. Well, I got to stay till 30. You are retarded. <laughs> you have a mental disability. <laughs> if you have this grand illusion, you have to stay in for 30 years because of 75%, you know, uh, that you get of your, you are an idiot. I will make, I literally will make up that difference of what that would be in retirement in one year. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it's like night and day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People don't understand that. Yeah. Right. And then so many of them, uh, can I add to what you just yeah. said? 
when you get out, don't take your uh, retirement income as, tar- as part of your total income. Yeah. Don't look at it and go, hey, you know, I'm making X in retirement. All I need is like, you know, $30,000 a year job. No, that's your retirement. Yeah. Use it for retirement. Get what your value is out here yep. in the private sector. And, and I don't know why these guys don't think that way. You're worth way more than you think. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, back a little bit to that is... If you have grand ambitions, you're going to be, you know, a three-star, four-star general, sure, or a CSM at the nom level, sure. Okay, that's fine. But if you're just hanging on and you know you're hanging on because you have this thing that you just need to try to milk it for all it's worth, do the Army a favor. Get out now. You're not doing right by the military by staying in. There's other people that will fill your gap. If you think you're irreplaceable, again, you have a mental disability. You're replaceable. They forget your name a week later. Okay, there. But before your change of responsibility or change of command is even done, there's a staff working the next thing that's happening the next day behind the scenes. Like, so don't hang on longer than you need to. And then just lastly, for those people transitioning out, like, it's going to be okay. Just relax. Be comfortable with yourself. Make up for time lost by sitting down and talking to talking to your wife, your daughter, your sons about those things that you just used to kind of ignore because you're like, I don't have time for this shit right now. And just listen to them and shut up and let them talk about it and just act like you care until you do care because they miss you. They love you and you've been robbing them. You've made a sacrifice, but your sacrifice is doing what you wanted to do. They didn't get a choice. Yeah, sure, your wife might have or your husband might have. Yeah, okay, they made a choice to marry you, but they didn't get it. They didn't get it. You know, like one recommendation. Sorry, this is a random thing. I, I, I always think that a spouse, you ever read the book uh, Once an Eagle? No. Okay. It's, right, it's, it. it's required reading for military like officers. I don't think it should be. I think it should be required reading for spouses. Because basically it shows you how terrible it is to be a military spouse. <laughs> no, I don't think I've ever yeah, heard it's a of it. Long yeah. book. It's, like, <laughs> it's longer than the Bible. It's a terrible book. But uh, anyway, uh, the point being is, is like they're the ones that have really sacrificed. So make it about them. Everything you do, make it about them. Spend time with them. Love on them. Do the things that you used to not have time to do and just enjoy the shit out of it because it's fun. It's so cool to do it. And just, it's going to be all right. All right. Appreciate. I mean, I don't have to say this again. Appreciate you coming Man, on. It was awesome. Um, Thank you so much. And t- sharing so much about your journey and your story and everything. But also, I can see so many future episodes that we can sit down and mm-hmm. talk about from leadership to, you know, some of the other aspects you talk, uh, talked about, whether it's transition. You'll have a little bit more under your belt in terms of time here out here in the private yeah. sector that we could probably even dive into. Yeah, absolutely. And the differences between um, <laughs> life out here and life out there, which uh, just in leadership alone could probably uh, cover a whole podcast on those two things so thank you so much again driving uh what 10 miles down the road and yeah, uh, joining and us I, but i really appreciate it man yeah i drove my jeep my wife's jeep without the top on too so it's totally more <laughs> miserable miserable drive well now it's time to go uh, break bread and go let's break a it. beer and let's uh, let's go have some let's fun go. so thanks again thank you